All right, so this morning uh, is kind of a doctrinal sermon, and we're going to cover just the idea of, or not the idea, but the, the office of an apostle. So I'm going to be talking about apostleship this morning, and this is one of the reasons I want to cover this is because there are people out there there's, uh, that will claim to be apostles today, and I think that's probably most commonly found in Pentecostal churches where people are going to be called apostles and stuff like that. And I want to just make sure that we have some clarity, though, on, on what an apostle is and really just go to the Bible to get as much understanding and clarity on this as we can. The word apostle, just in general, is a, it's, it's really just a religious term, and it's one that you're going to find only used in uh, regards to Scripture. It's not a word. Like, so if you go to the dictionary definition of apostle, it's, it's all going to be just related to the Bible. It, it's, not, it's not like used really in any other context than this. So in situations like that, it's really generally not a good idea to get a dictionary definition just in general because now you're just totally relying on some secular source of some definition for a word that is really ultimately just religiously used or it's just used in the context of the Bible. Obviously, we always have to use the context of Scripture no matter what the word is to get the, the proper understanding. There's many words that have many definitions. But specifically with just like an apostle, we really want to make sure we're just looking to the scripture to give us a good overview of what is this, what, what does this mean. And um, we're going to see here, we have, I have a lot of scripture to turn to, but hopefully it won't take too long to get through this. Um, just because I want to be relatively exhaustive in the verses that we look at. I've left out some, of course, just for, I would consider redundancy, where they're basically stating kind of the same thing. There's many places where the Apostle Paul is going to say, like, uh, that he's an apostle in the opening of his letters to churches. We'll look at a couple of those, but not all of them, for example. So, uh, but, but, but it is important to get you know, a comprehensive view so we could understand, well, if someone's claiming to be an apostle, apostle is an office. And we started here in 1 Corinthians 12. If you look down there, verse number 27, the Bible says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The body of Christ is the church and all the people that are in the church are members of that church. We're all part of that body is what he's talking about. He says, and God hath set some in the church first apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Of course, the answer to that is no. And I'm not going to, you know, we just read that entire chapter. It has a lot to do with spiritual gifts, but it also lists off these people that are, that God has ordained to be within the church holding that office. They're an apostle or they're a prophet or they're a teacher within the church. And at the time of this writing, there were apostles. There were, you know, this office was very important of an apostle. We even see the apostle Paul defending his apostleship multiple times when people are like, you know, he's like, you seem to need a proof of me. And again, we'll probably, we'll look at that passage as well, but it's something that gets called into question and because it is, you know, he says first apostles, it, it's, it's like kind of the top position within the church. And we see the apostles. And normally when you think of the apostles, you think of the 12, right? The 12 disciples, which are also called the 12 apostles that were appointed by Jesus Christ. Now, there are more than 12 apostles, and we'll see that. I'll prove that to you. The Apostle Paul, of course, is the most obvious example who was not selected by Jesus Christ and was one of the 12. But the 12 are referred to in, you know, distinctively from anyone else who's called a, a, an apostle. It is the 12 apostles, that, that uh, a, a very separate role for the 12 as opposed to anyone else who might carry that title or carry that office of an apostle. So let's try to get an understanding of this. And this isn't the most important doctrine in the world, but you know what? It's in the Bible enough. And we have people who are false apostles that are trying to claim the name of an apostle. So it's important to know uh, why or what we believe about this and, and to be able to spot, well, how, what are the signs of a false apostle anyways? Well, if we know what a real apostle is, then 
It's easier to spot a false apostle. So uh, this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, just lists apostles as an office, right? So nothing there particular necessarily about what that is other than he gave some to be apostles. Very similarly in Ephesians chapter 4, you don't have to turn or turn if you would to Matthew chapter 10. Ephesians 4, one of my favorite passages for showing people the importance of going to church and expressing that uh, you know, God has, has appointed various people, various men to be in positions to help you to grow spiritually, to help you understand the word of God. And uh, in verse 11 it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so again, listing off multiple offices within a church and starts off again with apostles being the first one that is listed because that was those were the primary, uh, the top office that Jesus established when creating the New Testament church. And if you look at scripture, who are the main key players in the New Testament? It's the 12, right? Peter, James, John, you know, all these figures that have then uh, been leading the charge and, and sending people out and, and the ones administering at a very high level a lot of the work that was being done, the evangelistic work that was being done and, and ordaining people to go out and sending out evangelists and, and spreading the gospel and getting churches started in all these various locations. Uh, the apostles were the ones primarily behind that big push and, and uh, were given authority to do many things. So let's look real quick here at the 12 apostles that are listed or mentioned in Matthew chapter 10, verse number one, the Bible says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then look at verse number two, it says, now the names of the 12 apostles are these, the first Simon, who's called Peter, and then it lists off the 12, okay? Now, if you didn't look at anything else in the scripture, you might just be like, oh, well, disciples and apostle, because it, it looks like it might be using it interchangeably here. But it's not, okay? This is not being used interchangeably. It, they do fall into both categories, though. So I'm not going to teach too much on, on discipleship, but... Uh, um, the apostles are in a category above a disciple. A disciple is just a follower. So Jesus had many disciples, and there was 120 gathered in Acts in that early church after the resurrection of Jesus Christ that were waiting to be endued uh, with power from on high and preaching the gospel, you know, everything that happened in Acts chapter 2. There's 120 people gathered together in that room. They were all disciples of Jesus Christ, but they weren't all apostles. Right? There's many followers of Jesus Christ, but they weren't all uh, labeled or carried the label or distinction of an apostle. The disciples, the 12 disciples, they were definitely disciples. They were following Jesus Christ, but they were also elevated to the status of being an apostle. And one of the things that's going to mark an apostle and what's going to highlight this and just keep this in your mind as we look at all these various passages, I may not always specify this as we continue throughout but they have the power to do these many things that were listed in, in Matthew 10, 1, unclean spirits, you know, casting them out, healing, and, and doing all of these great miracles um, through, obviously, the power of the Holy Ghost. But not only that, the apostles, and we'll see this in a, in a little bit, had the power to also give the power of the, of the Holy Ghost on people who were believers. You could have people who were disciples, but they didn't receive these extra gifts, the gifts of healing or the gifts of tongues or things like that necessarily until the apostles laid hands on them. So um, that is an important distinction as well, but we'll get into that get a little bit ahead of myself here. So Matthew 10, 1, 12 disciples gave them power and then calls them the 12 apostles. Mark 6, 7 and turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 6. Mark 6, verse number 7, the Bible says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for the journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse. 
So again, at this point, he's calling the 12 at the beginning of the chapter and just sending them forth. It doesn't reference whether they're called disciples or apostles. He just said, this is who he's sending out. He called the 12. Then the story transitions to the story of John the Baptist being beheaded, right? So, so at this point in Mark, he sends out the 12. Then we hear about John the Baptist being beheaded. And then we jump down to the end of that story. Just, just to give you the context without reading the whole thing, jump down to verse number 28. It says, and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So that's a reference to the disciples just hearing about what happened to John the Baptist, and they, um, they buried his body. This ends the story of John the Baptist, but now we, we see the return of the twelve, right? Because the twelve were sent out. This all happened with John the Baptist. The there's, there's lots of disciples. Remember, it doesn't just have to be the twelve that shows up to take the body of John the Baptist. It just says the disciples. It doesn't say the twelve. It doesn't reference anyone in particular. It's just other followers of Christ. They're friends with John the Baptist, right? It's the same ministry, so they're going and taking care of that. That story ends. Now we get back to the return in verse 30 of the 12, and where now it's calling them the apostles. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And I just think it's interesting to point out that it's consistent through the Gospels where we see the disciples or the 12, when they become called the apostles, it's after Jesus gives them these powers of the Holy Ghost to do these special miracles and special acts. They weren't really referred to as apostles before that, and now they are. Okay, that is a, a very key element to remember there. This story is also mentioned in Luke. Uh, turn, if you would, to... To Acts chapter 1, Luke 9 verse 1 says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Then in verse number 10 says, And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Beth Bethsaida. So, the reason I'm even bringing this up is because we saw in Matthew and Mark and Luke the same moment where they transition from being called the disciples to being called apostles. It's like the first time they're being called apostles in all of those instances. And it's, it's very consistent across both. that it, it's, it's literally calling them disciples. Jesus gives them power to do these great miracles. And then when they return, they're called apostles. So you, you can't ignore that aspect of apostleship of being given those special powers from on high to be able to do this work and that they're being sent out, right? The apostles are being sent out. They're going to other people. It's not just uh, the office isn't sitting around an office in, in a church building, right? They're going out and doing this evangelistic work. They're doing this help work. You know, they're, they're ministering, right? And they're being sent out to do this job. In uh, I've been in Acts chapter 1, I'll just read real quick from Luke chapter 6, verse number 13. The Bible says, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. And this is, again, before they're referred to, like in, in Luke 9, I just said, they're sent out as disciples, they come back as apostles after he gives them power. But Luke 6 is just referring to the fact that he called his disciples, he chose the 12, right? This is at the choosing of the 12 disciples, but he also named them apostles. They didn't receive the, the power, but this is just demonstrating like these are the people that he called and he names them apostles. And I, I want to highlight the point that Jesus is the one that named them the apostles. He's the one that chose them and he's the one that selected them. And this is going to come up as well here in just a minute. You're in Acts chapter one, look at verse number one. The Bible reads, uh, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And of course, the author here of the book of Acts is, is uh, Luke. So um, let's keep reading here. Verse number two, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. 
So again, Jesus is the one who chose. It says, uh, again, let's read that, verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up. Who's the he was taken up? Jesus. After that, he, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. That, those pronouns are all referring to Jesus. So Jesus is the one who chose these apostles to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So it's mentioning here that Jesus was also his, it, he was also shown alive after his resurrection to his apostles. So that's going to come in here important when we look at the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul was an apostle, clearly, and I'll read a little bit for that uh, for you, but turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the sermon, there are uh, a few instances here. where the Apostle Paul opens up his letters. For example, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. So he's saying there that he was called to be an apostle. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Again, referencing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then in Galatians chapter 1, verse number 1, Paul, an apostle... Again, identifying himself as an apostle. But then there's a parenthetical statement there. It says, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So the apostles, I think, again, clearly, and Paul's specifying, look, no man made me an apostle. It was not by man. It wasn't of men. So it wasn't from a man that gave me this title of apostle. It wasn't any by, but I didn't even use men to make me apostle. He said, Jesus Christ made me an apostle, which is, you know, to, to, I think, put him on equal standing with the 12 that Jesus had chosen. And again, this is important, and this is going to be very important, actually, as you'll see, because there are other people who are named apostles, but were not of the twelve. And we see the selection here where the Apostle Paul is making himself known that he was chosen by Jesus Christ specifically. Uh, and the others that were listed as being apostles, not that it was necessarily wrong, weren't either, we don't have evidence that they were chosen specifically by Jesus Christ. And why am I even going into this at all? The reason why I'm going into this at all is because of what we see at the beginning of the book of Acts, where they go to fill the office of Judas. And in the book of Acts, if you're familiar with that story, it's in Acts chapter 1. I'll, I'll read this for you. I was going to get to this in a minute, but just stay, stay where you're at in 1 Corinthians 9. You can flip there if you want to, but uh, I'll read this real quick at the end of Acts chapter 1. Now, the, the, the disciples were well aware of the prophecy, and they were making this connection when they knew that, hey, there's only 11 apostles now. There's only 11. We need to fill the gap, the void that's left because Judas, obviously by transgression, he fell, and it was prophesied, and they knew from Scripture that that office needed to be replaced. So what they did was, well, I'll read this for you. Verse number 21 in Acts chapter 1, the Bible reads, Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So what they're saying is, look, we need to choose, and they're going to ask for God's direction in this, who should fill this role? Who should fill this office that is left vacant because Judas fell? And the criteria that they are putting on this is, look, they had to have been with us beginning at the baptism of John, so they had to be a disciple since John baptized Jesus. 
until all the way through um, the, the crucifixion and, of course, the resurrection. And they said that they also had to be a witness with us of the resurrection. So they're looking at this. Look, this is an important job. They have to be a good, solid witness. They have to have known all of this stuff that happened. They had to have seen the resurrection. They had to have known kind of a lot of the whole story in order to be a good witness and to be on the same ground as the 12, as the, as the other 11, because they were with him for that whole period. And they don't want to just necessarily add someone brand new to the 12 as, as you know, uh, someone who maybe got saved later or wasn't really part of the ministry early on or some, things like that because they wouldn't have as good of a testimony of declaring all the things were true. You can understand the reasoning behind all of this and you can understand that uh, why you would want to do this because uh, the scripture said that um, in verse number 25 there is what, the, is what they're referencing. It says in verse 24, uh, and they had prayed and said thou lord who, which knowest the hearts of all men show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place and they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles so they knew he needed to be replaced, so they just said, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Well, let's find people who might fit this bill of being with us the whole time. They find this, these two people and say, okay, here's our candidates. But they still don't know who's right, so they basically just they cast lots or they just vote, just put it up for a vote. And the problem with this is, you know, we don't see this as anywhere in Scripture as being the way that, that you need to, to do things to fill this role and specifically with that of an apostle and i think they it's not that they were trying to do anything wrong but they were just trying to do what was right but i still think with the lack of knowledge because what it seems like to me and you could disagree with this but it seems like to me the apostle paul was the one that was chosen to fill that office because he was chosen by jesus christ just as the other 11 had and what we end up seeing in scripture, in the evidence, and what we have here is all the fruit of the Apostle Paul. He clearly, he stated, stated over and over and over again in scripture that he was ordained an apostle. He was chosen an apostle. He was chosen by Jesus Christ. He's an apostle to the Gentiles, just as the others are an apostle to, the, to Israel and the Jews. And, and, he's, and he's, you know, he keeps talking about his office, the importance of his office. He, and there's no way he's not on the same standing from what we see in all of Scripture with the 11. Like he's not in a lesser role whatsoever when it comes to the weight or the authority of the office and his apostleship in Scripture. So uh, obviously Matthias, who, who was chosen here, a great guy, a great man of God, probably served the Lord wonderfully, but... They, they, he wasn't selected by Jesus to be one of the 12. He was just voted in, and they were just trusting that God was going to guide and lead their vote to get the right person in. But it, it wasn't really based on anything that we can see as being that that's how it ought to have been done. They may have been trying to fill it a little bit too soon, uh, but they didn't know, right? And, and, and so it's not like I'm trying to cast shade on, on any of the disciples or Peter or anyone else for doing this, but it just becomes apparent later as we're looking at this stuff and we look at the importance of the, uh, the 12 especially, the, the 12, because they were continually looked to also as the pillars, as the people that, look, when there's a, a question, when there's anything in, in, in question about how are we doing things moving forward, it always went back to the 12 or the 11, right? It would go back to the apostles that were with Christ to get matters settled of how things need to move forward on what the doctrine should be and things like that in the early church. That's who it was looked upon. And they were also the ones who were laying their hands on people and giving the, uh, the power of the Holy Ghost unto others, which we know the apostle Paul also was uh, fully able to do that as well 
I had you turn to, where are, what, what passage are you in? 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 9. So again, the Apostle Paul, look at this in verse number 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? And here's where he's defending himself you know, against the people who are trying, especially at the Church of Corinth, who are, who are trying to dismiss the authority the Apostle Paul had and just try to downplay his office and, and, and kind of talking trash about him. And he's saying, look, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He's seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was actually the last one to see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that in a minute as well. He says, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. Like if all people that's going to question my apostles, like, like I'm, if I'm not an apostle unto them, I have to be unto you. Doubtless I'm an apostle unto you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. He's like, you are the fruit of my labors. You're like, like you exist as a result of my efforts being an apostle of Christ and going forward and preaching the gospel and getting this church started. Like, like you are the result. So how can you say that I'm not an apostle? <laughs> like you're the evidence that God has given me uh, this office with the work that he had done literally at that place. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister or wife as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. So again, he's comparing himself with the other apostles and, and saying, you know, don't we have the same rights, the same power to do these things? Um, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Of course, I already mentioned this without quoting it. Romans eleven thirteen says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Referring to himself once more as being an apostle. So, comparing this with what the disciples did or the apostles did in Acts chapter 1, it seems to me that Jesus chose the Apostle Paul to be the 12th. And again, if you disagree with that and you just think, no, Matthias is the one who took that, the Apostle Paul is just another apostle, you know, that's fine. I'm not dogmatic about this of saying that there's so much evidence here that that has to be the way it is. But looking at the thing as a whole, that's the way it, that's the way it appears to me. Yeah. Okay? And that the 12 definitely were specifically chosen by Jesus Christ. Matthias didn't seem to be specifically chosen by Jesus Christ with any clarity whatsoever other than they voted him in. Okay, and again, nothing against Matthias or nothing against the fact that he's called an apostle because there were other people referred to as apostles as well. We're going to see some of that here. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, Barnabas is even referred to as an apostle. So he's not just a disciple, but Barnabas is also an apostle. Look at verse number 12 in Acts chapter 14. Bible reads, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, comma, Barnabas and Paul, comma, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. So when the apostles heard it, who were the apostles? Barnabas and Paul. And there was no, in this story, there was no one else there with them. It's not like they had... Peter or James or John or you know uh, any of the other any of the other eleven. When you read this whole story in context, it's just Paul and Barnabas that have gone out to this place, and so it's very clear that okay, well, Barnabas and apostles is plural, not the apostle Paul and Barnabas. The apostles who who are the apostles Barnabas and Paul so clearly Barnabas is is being referenced here as apostle he was not one of the 12 he was not you know there's no indication either that Barnabas was specifically handpicked by Jesus Christ while he was alive on this earth to be an apostle uh, as we saw the apostle Paul made claim to as well as the 11 absolutely were that Jesus named them apostles but he is still being referred to as an apostle. And again, all of this is being said to 
find the clarity of what do we believe about apostleship? What, what is the Bible teaching here? So clearly, the 12 are special, no doubt about that. Whether 12 is in, Paul's included in one of those 12 or not, you know, the, the 12 were absolutely special. And we can see the Apostle Paul carried a lot of weight as well, whether you include him as one in the number of the 12 or not, um, as, as another pillar of the faith through the work that he did. Turn, if you would, to uh, Galatians chapter 1. If you want to follow all these passages, we're going to see another reference to um, another another person who's named an apostle. And I know it's a little bit exhaustive and, and not the most exciting sermon, but it's a study. It's a Bible study. We're going to look through the scripture and, and do the best doctrinal job that we can to understand what this is talking about. So please bear with me. Hopefully uh, you love looking into these things and you know gain a little, little education in an area that maybe you hadn't really thought a whole lot about. Look at verse number 15. The Bible reads in Galatians 1.15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And again, this is just highlighting or illustrating the fact that it wasn't of men that the Apostle Paul was named an apostle. Like, if Jesus Christ appears to you and is giving you a command to do something, you don't need to ask anyone else what to do. You do what Jesus tells you to do. Amen. And he's saying, I didn't even go to talk to these other people who were apostles before me. Like, they're apostles too. And he's not downplaying their role, but he's trying to emphasize, look, Jesus Christ made me an apostle. So he doesn't need permission from any other apostle to do the work of an apostle. He doesn't even need to go run it by them or even let them know, hey, by the way, Jesus made me an apostle. Jesus did make him an apostle. It requires no other validation from anyone else because he was made on the equal field or the equal uh, office of the rest of the apostles by Jesus Christ himself. Then, and then, so he's continuing this story. He's saying, I didn't go back to talk to any of these guys. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none. Look at this. Save James, the Lord's brother. So he's like, the other the apostles I didn't see, but I did see one other apostle. That other apostle was James, the Lord's brother. Now, James here, the Lord's brother, it's talking about his physical, you know, half-brother. It's talking about his other family members of Joseph and Mary. That's who James the Lord's brother is. So this isn't James of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These are the sons of jo this is the son of Joseph and Mary. And what we know from Scripture is that his own flesh, his own, his own family, did not believe on Jesus to be the Messiah while he was still alive. Even when he went up to the feast, they were saying like, oh, well, hey, I mean, you've got these followers. Why, why don't you just show yourself open? He's already said, look, people are trying to kill me. I'm not going to go there. And his own family is telling him like, well, hey, why don't, I mean, look, who, who has followers and doesn't want everything to be known openly? Why don't you just go? Right. And, and I don't know if it was necessarily mocking, but it was, it was kind of, <laughs> it, it, it almost was mocking him of saying, why don't you just go and do this? Right? Like, like if, if you're this great leader, then go tell the people. This is what they need to hear, right? So, uh, but then after, of course, his death, they realize, I think, at his death that, no, this is the Son of God and, and his resurrection, that then his family converted, right? And we, have, we definitely, James is, is a good example of that because he was then even called an apostle. So, Two people, we've got Barnabas, we've got James, named by name as being called apostles. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 
I'll read a couple other places for you, just not to belabor the point too much. First Thessalonians chapter 2 is where I'm going to read from right now. Verse number 6 says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. And you notice in what I just read, we, we, us, we, we. So this is not only the Apostle Paul, but also as the beginning of this letter to the church at Thessalonica starts off, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. Verse 2 says, We give thanks to God, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayer. So it starts off the whole book, we, we, us, we, we with Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus being listed as the people that are writing to the church. So they're also being included as the apostles, again, plural, of Christ in chapter 2. Does that make, are you following that? Does it make sense that those three, we have uh, Silvanus and Timotheus also being listed here as apostles, not just Paul, but they are included in the plural form there, uh, in this letter to the church of Thessalonica. So you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to explain, though, even though we have these other people who are also getting the label of an apostle, or receiving the office of an apostle, that weren't of the 12, we still have evidence that there's no more apostles still around today. Okay, and that, that office was specific at the birth of New Testament churches and specific for a very important reason, but that that office was no longer necessary after the churches got established in that early period and that the apostleship, we don't see the evidence of this anymore today. And we're going to look at some scripture regarding this as well. Verse number uh, 9 in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And they're a spectacle. There's something to be seen in the apostles' work and I still think this is going to tie back. And this, this passage doesn't specifically mention this. You could make an argument, well, why are they called a spectacle? Well, one, because they're going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, they're doing this work. They're turning the world upside down with their doctrine, with their beliefs. That's the most important thing. But they're also a spectacle because God has endued them with the power of all of these other gifts spiritual gifts of being able to speak with other tongues, being able to heal people, even raising from the dead. They're doing these great works that is a sight to be seen. It is a spectacle unto the world, and they're doing all of these great miracles and performing these miracles, which, honestly, we don't see people doing this type of ministry work or having these spiritual gifts today. Yeah. It's not in the Pentecostal church. It's not. Amen. First of all, the Pentecostal church doesn't even have salvation right. right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, they believe that you could lose your salvation. It's a works-based salvation. So right out of the gate, you've got that wrong. They're not even children of God, let alone being endued with power from the Most High. Second of all, those ones, the, the gift that they seemingly, they want to tell you that they have, it's a fraud. Yeah. It's a scam. Yeah. At best, they're being possessed by demons when they think that they're speaking with other tongues. And, and rambling off and spitting off, uh, you know, some unknown language. We see scripture teaching us that when people spake with other tongues, there were people who understood exactly what they were saying because it was their native language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when the Holy Ghost came upon someone and gave them the gift of speaking with another tongue, they were speaking Arabian. They were speaking Spanish. They were speaking, you know, whatever other language people had at the time in their own language and they understood them exactly because and they were languages that they hadn't learned before that's what it means to have that spirit of speaking with tongues it was not just babbling off with some unintelligible sounds 
to a group of people and some other person just saying, oh yeah, I know what they're saying. They're lying. They just want to have the spotlight and look real spiritual for themselves. Oh, I've got the, I've got the gift of, of understanding tongues. I can't say what he just said, but I can tell you what it means. Yeah, that's the easiest job to have. No one knows what they said, and you're just going to be like, oh yeah, that's what he said. Who's going to prove you wrong? It's not even a real language. And yeah, and it's kind of like to, to claim to have these powers and these abilities, even the powers of healing, right? The, the, te the televangelists, you'll see this, they'll claim to have these powers of healing and stuff. They're staged events. Because if it were real, it would be evident. Like there would be no doubt about it. When, when the, the apostles were healing people, it was evident. I mean, no one can speak against this because they were healing people that grew up in a town like the blind guy. Hey, everybody knew he was blind. And then they're saying, well, hey, by what power, what authority are you doing these things, right? And, and, and they, they'd be questioning them and they're saying, look, this is the power of Jesus Christ, you know, the guy that you crucified. Amen. That's how this guy can see. And, and they're like, well, we know he was born blind and all this other stuff. And, and this, these are the types of miracles that are happening that everyone recognized. Even the people that hated it, the Jews, the Pharisees that wanted to shut down Christianity, they wanted to stamp it out. They would confer with themselves going, look, a great miracle is done. We can't hide this. Like, we can't, we you have nothing to say about this. We, we, you know, everybody knows that this happened. That is how the real miracles and the people who are endued with these spiritual gifts of the Holy Ghost, that's how that operates. Amen. It, is, it is undeniable. And that they're able to just heal people because they had the power of the Holy Ghost upon them. It wasn't these setups in a, in, a, in a stadium that everyone has to pay, you know, however much money to attend and, and, you know, whatever to fill up their stadium. It was people who had these, yeah, and, and send in your check and we'll send you the, the prayer cloth or whatever to, to, to heal all your problems. That's people who are making merchandise of people. That's people who have the love of money in their heart and they're covetous and they don't care for people, they care about themselves. That's what we see today. You do not see the power of God in the people who are claiming to have the power of God and they're claiming to be apostles and they're claiming to have these gifts. It's nonsense. It's fraud. They're false apostles. But here we see that they're sent forth last. They're set up to be this spectacle unto the world. Flip over, if you would, to chapter 15. Because I would still even say this, that it appears that the people here who are being named apostles would, would have also been witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they definitely were endued with power. Let's say, let's say there was an apostle named here that was not a witness of the resurrected Jesus Christ. They still were given the, the, the power and had the laying on of the hands of the apostles at that time to confer that power to them and that, that authority and that office to them as being an apostle. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3, the Bible says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So, again, we're showing clearly now from Scripture that Jesus was seen of all the apostles. Amen. And he references James as being one of those apostles. So, I think we can deduce here that anyone else who's named legitimately an apostle in Scripture has seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen. Because after he was seen of these other people, it says he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And then he says, and last of all, 
he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. He's like, I was late to the show. I was late to, the, to being a Christian. I was late, you know, because he uh, persecuted the church ignorantly and unbelief. But then when he got saved, you know, Jesus had already resurrected. He'd already shown himself alive by many infallible proofs. He showed these things to the disciples, to the apostles, to the people that were serving Christ well before the apostle Paul. But then he's like, finally, he also showed himself to me. He revealed himself to me. He saw Jesus Christ. He saw the resurrected Jesus Christ when he was on his way to Damascus to continue persecuting the church. He saw him, and he received his orders from Jesus Christ. And he says, last of all. So the Apostle Paul is the last of anyone who has seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, excuse me. And that's what makes an apostle. I mean, even in, the, even in the definition of, in Acts chapter 1, that the disciples, they were saying they had to, you know, they had to have been there for the whole, they, they made the extra criteria of having to been around from the beginning. But clearly Jesus was showing that criteria wasn't necessary, but they did have to see the uh, resurrected Jesus Christ because he was the one ultimately who was choosing his apostles. And here we see unequivocally that he was seen of all the apostles and that the apostle Paul was the last one to have seen him. He says, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And again, he's humbling himself because of what he did, but he still is an apostle. Now, I, I've been mentioning this multiple times throughout the sermon, but turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 6. Because there is what's called the signs of an apostle. And I'll read, while you're turning to Acts 6, I'll read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible reads, I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Again, he's saying, I am not behind any of those other guys at all. I am equal with them. But again, he's talking to the Corinthians, right? This is where he's getting kind of the most attacks on who he is, on his office, on his authority, is coming out of Corinth. So not only is he mentioning this in the first epistle, he's also referencing it again in the second epistle to the church of Corinth saying, look, you've compelled me to become this fool and glorying. He has, to, he has to list off his qualifications and stuff to these people because they're calling into question his status. And he's like, I, I'm not behind any of these guys in my authority as an apostle. Verse 12 says, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs of an apostle. So obviously there needs to be, you know, there are signs that go along with the apostleship. With being in the office of apostle, they had these signs confirming that they were actually apostles. And we read plenty about the apostle Paul being able to heal. We read plenty about Peter and James and John being able to heal. We read about other people having these gifts of doing these various things, uh, these spiritual gifts. And obviously those gifts to do some of those things came upon others as well. But the apostles absolutely had to have those things confirming they were the apostles of, of, uh, of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible reads, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose uh, Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles. So these men were disciples. 
and they were needed because the church had grown so much that the apostles can't handle all of the work that needs to be done. The daily ministration, just the, 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 the operation of the church and being able to minister to the people of the church that needed ministering. So they said, we need, we need more people here. So they gathered together seven men, but they gathered them. It says here, they set them before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The apostles are the one ordaining these people in the church to do this job. And it says, and, uh, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Flip over real quick to chapter 8. But there's still a distinction. They didn't make them apostles. They, they made them, I, would, I, I think what lines up in scripture is deacons. They made them, they ordained them to be the deacons of the church that were helping and holding this office of being able to manage a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks while they committed themselves unto more important jobs of studying the word and prayer. Though that's what they needed to do and focus on more than doing all the day-to-day -day stuff. They just needed more people to help with that. Acts chapter 8, verse number 14, the Bible says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when we saw about receiving the Holy Ghost, it's all about the power of the Holy Ghost, so receiving the spiritual gifts of the Holy Ghost. They were saved. They had the Holy Spirit. They were born again. Okay? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit was already given for all believers at this point in history. But when they show up, they hear about their conversion, they hear about them, they're saved, they're baptized, but no one there is performing any of the miracles or had received any of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So they come down in order to pray for them and in order to give out some of the, the spiritual gifts from God. It says in verse 17, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So the apostles had the power and authority to give the gifts of the Holy Ghost unto people who were saved. That was one of the, the things that, that signified who, you know, being an apostle in general, right? Of being able to, to transfer or to give this power of the Holy Ghost unto others. Uh, verse, 19, uh, verse 18 says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So he's putting this together saying, Oh, the apostles are able to give this gift to other people. And that's true. The apostles were able to do that. So he's like, Well, I want this. So, hey, can, I'll give you a big donation. Here, can I, can I write, take out my checkbook? How's the thousand dollars sound? You know, can I have that power too? I want to be able to give other people this power to to have spiritual gifts and stuff. And obviously, that was way out of line. He shouldn't be offering money for the gifts of God and things like that. Um, but we know that uh, Simon did believe that he was, even though he was a sorcerer in the past, like he he had received Christ and gotten saved. But he, he's a babe in Christ, and he's trying to get like the same authority that the apostles have. And he's trying to take a shortcut to doing it, and he gets rebuked uh, sharply. The Bible says in verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Um, and, and on and on. There, we're almost done. One last place. I think we have just barely enough time to look at this. So I would submit that why we don't have apostles today is similar to the reason why we don't have the prophets in the sense of a prophet that's giving the word of God, right? That's giving us more and revealing more of the word of God because the word of God is complete, right? That is done. That's established. Amen. With revelation, you know, it's, it's done. The, the book is, com the whole book is complete. All the books now have been delivered unto human, human beings, unto mankind. We have received the word of God. 
Now, a prophet in the sense of someone who is being used to give the, the word of God is no longer necessary of getting new revelations from God. It's complete. It's done. So that office is no longer necessary. Similarly, as the New Testament church has been established, the change of the law, like Hebrews talks about, that was necessary of transitioning from Old Testament worship to New Testament worship, from the Levitical priesthood to the priesthood of Melchizedek or Jesus Christ, right? The, the changes that needed to be made got the stamp of approval by God through the Holy Ghost of men that were able to perform these miracles so that people can actually see it and have more confidence in the changes because change is hard look when you when you're talking about doing things different and we're taking away the sacrifices we're not going to do this stuff anymore because jesus is a sacrifice it needs to be confirmed right it was confirmed through the power of the holy ghost it was confirmed through jesus christ himself talking about these things and then of course after that the holy men of god that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, that were performing miracles, and that were doing these things and receiving the gifts of the Holy Ghost, they did that for as long as it needed to be done, but after that first generation or two, it's, it's, it's done, it's established. The, the churches have been established. There's, there's enough now to move forward with that we don't need to continually see miracles done regularly to have churches established and know that it's of God. Amen. Okay, this is, when we look about miracles, the reason why miracles are miracles is because they don't happen very often. Yeah. It's not a daily thing. And throughout history, miracles were special occasions. They were special events. It's not normal day-to-day -day stuff. Now, do miracles still happen? Yes, I believe they do wholeheartedly. I know that miracles still exist because God is not restricted or restrained, but he's also not pouring out the same gifts that needed to be poured out in order to establish the churches as they began new in the New Testament. It, it all makes sense. So the apostles were the ones that had that power. They were chosen by Jesus Christ. There was a select number of them. It wasn't some huge number. It was people that had seen the, resur the, the resurrected Jesus Christ firsthand and that they had the power also then to be able to give out the, uh, the Holy Ghost unto other believers. But those that received those spiritual gifts did not have the power to then transfer and be able to lay hands on other people to receive those same gifts of the Holy Ghost. They were recipients. They weren't, they weren't elevated to apostleship to then be able to be the ones giving out that, if that makes sense. Now, one interesting passage, and I'll let, I'll, I'll let you, you know, obviously all of this you have to make up your mind about, but turn if you to Revelation chapter 18, if you're already there. I don't know. Um, will apostles come back? Maybe. <laughs> That's my answer is maybe. Okay, I just think this is really interesting. I normally don't like covering too many things if I'm not too sure about it. Um, I am very confident in, in my take on the apostleship, but it's not something that's like going to drive a wedge between me and anyone else as far as I'm concerned, if you believe a little bit different about, about uh, the office of an apostle, because this is, this is a, a, probably a tertiary doctrine, not, not super important. Um, obviously, we want to be able to recognize false apostles, people who claim this stuff. It's kind of like, you don't match up with what I'm reading about apostles <laughs> in the Bible, the people who are claiming to be an apostle. But one, just, just, because this, this passage can be read more than one way. And it, and it's, it could be 100% true, but it, it, I mean, it is true, but, but there's different readings of this that I don't think you can disprove. We'll know one day for certain uh, when the time comes, but since it's a future event, it's a little bit harder to discern what is being referred to. And, and uh, this is talking about the destruction of Babylon. And this is a little bit deeper because if you don't already have a, a, a good foundation or knowledge base on Babylon, uh, one of the things that's important to understand here is that Babylon 
There's the spirit of Babylon that has kind of existed through all time. So there's physical Babylon, but that physical location of where Satan's seat is, where the devil is like operating on this earth and kind of one of the, the main hubs of the wickedness and the spiritual wickedness high places has transferred physical locations throughout history. There have been different people who were, where Satan's seat is where ultimately in the end times here in Revelation chapter 18, it's referred to as Babylon, right? But physically where that exists or where that will exist, we don't know for certain, right? I believe that it's, it seems to be describing the United States. If, that were to, if these events were to happen in a relatively shorter period of time uh, from now, I, I would think that it, it lines up somewhere in the United States. But I don't know when <laughs> these events will take place. It could be hundreds of years from now, and this country may not even exist. I mean, I don't know, right? Like, there's, there's certain things like that. I don't know. But regardless of that, this is in relation to Babylon, but because there's a history of Babylon having, you know, I could consider that, that spirit of Babylon being set up in multiple locations, you can read this either historically or just applying it to the events that are described specifically in Revelation 18. So without further ado, let's look at this, these three verses, starting in verse number 18. The Bible says, And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. This is the destruction of Babylon, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she made desolate. The destruction of Babylon here, it's the merchants that are all upset that this place is destroyed. Because everyone else is made rich. Why? Because they're selling their goods to this consumer country, this consumer city, Babylon, that's being destroyed. So everyone who's selling stuff into Babylon that has all this wealth, that has all this money, that's able to make everyone else rich, they're upset by that. So this is what's going on. This is one of the reasons why I think that the United States kind of fits this bill, because we are a spending society. We have all these riches and just spending and, and how many things are getting imported from China, from Japan, from Taiwan, you know, from, from all over the world. We are bringing in the goods of the world here. Obviously, other countries import goods. But to the scale or magnitude that America is and the amount of money being spent here lines up, in my mind, with the devastation of like, oh man, what are we going to do now? This is like the sword. This is our bread and butter. This is where we're making all our money, right? So that's why I believe that. But this is clearly talking about the destruction of the city at that time. Verse 20 says, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So it mentions the apostles and prophets. Now, is that talking about the people who lived all the way back in Jesus' time? It very could well be just referring to those people and including them because Babylon continues forward and the wickedness of Babylon and the spiritual wickedness in high places has been acting on believers and the people doing the work of God for all time, basically. Okay? So that's why I think, yeah, you can read this and say, yeah, that's just talking about the people in the past. But... We also know from the book of Daniel that there's going to be great exploits done by the believers in the last times. And during that time of great tribulation, there are going to be people who are standing strong for the word of God. And it would also appear to me that, yes, Acts 2 was mentioned as being a fulfillment of the prophecy from Joel, talking about the, the, um, the spirit of God being poured out on the on, um, on men, on the handmaidens, and, and preaching the word of God and doing all this stuff, and they, and they tie Acts 2 in with that prophecy. But that prophecy in Joel is also talking about the, the day of the Lord. Right. So that would indicate to me that it looks like it's very high probability that there's a dual prophetic, dual prophecy happening there. Mm -hmm. That not only was that, because it absolutely was a fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. I mean, there's no question about that. 100% it had to be because that's what's in Scripture and that's what was stated. But it didn't seem to be a, a very clean, full fulfillment because of the references to the day of the Lord 
in the very direct context of that fulfillment. So it makes me think that, well, we may also see a pouring out of spiritual gifts right at the, the last, right before the day of the Lord, which would be when Jesus Christ comes back. So I said at the beginning here, or in this last section, I don't know. But it's just kind of interesting. I just think it's kind of neat to look at this stuff. And I want to be pretty thorough and exhaustive of looking at the, the references of apostles. I think the takeaway, though, is they clearly had a specific office. It was one of authority, and it was one in which they had the mighty acts that were, that were signifying their apostleship that went along with that. They were able to give gifts of the, of the Spirit. They had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. For all of these reasons, I don't see any apostles today. I don't see, and especially amongst the people who are seemingly doing the most work for the Lord too, right? I mean, where, where God's work is, be, is really being done, the evangelistic work, you know, it, it's just not, we don't see that presence. So it would lead me to think that, okay, well, that office is no longer necessary. And people who are going to claim to be apostles these days, I mean, if you just check their salvation, you're going to find out right off the bat that they're not even saved. At least the ones that I've come into contact with or I've been aware of or I've seen or I've known. Okay. I, obviously, I can't speak for everyone in the whole world because I haven't talked to everyone in the whole world, so I don't know if there's someone claiming to be an apostle that's actually born again and saved, but I'd be surprised to come across that. So um, I hope this sermon helps. I know it's a little bit dry for a Sunday morning, but um, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, your word, and I pray that you please help us to, to study your word and make sure that we're clear on on uh, the truth from your word and, and help us to, to understand that we could do things, especially since an apostle is, is an office that was given in scripture. Lord, uh, we want to do everything here in our church, in this body, uh, according to your word. And we, we, we want to everything to function properly, Lord. So if there's an office that's not filled, that ought to be filled. If there were things that we're doing here that is not in accordance with your word, Lord, please bring those to our attention. Help us as we study your word to, to have our minds illuminated, to, 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 to lead us into the truth and the wisdom from your word, that we could be wise and, and do things the way they ought to be done. Lord, we want to be pleasing in your sight. We want to be used of you um, to the utmost, we see that where the apostles went and laid hands on people, that uh, the, the word of God continued to grow and, and that the work abounded in all of those areas, Lord. And so uh, this is why we, we care about your words. We, we want to study them and show ourselves approved as uh, uh, workmen that need not to be ashamed, dear Lord. And God, just bless our church, bless everyone here. Uh, help us continue to increase our wisdom. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.